to this session. Today we have uh, Sanjeev Goyal, and Sanjeev is going to talk to us about large scale experiments on networks, a new platform with application. This should be very interesting right now because it's very hard to do a uh, in the lab experiment. So it should be a very interesting topic for these days. Uh, Sanjeev just doesn't need any introduction, but let me just uh, read out a few things about him. Sanjeev Goel is Professor of Economics and a Fellow of Christ's College, Cambridge. He got his BA from the University of Delhi, his MBA from IIM Ahmedabad, and his PhD from Cornell University. He has previously held chairs at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, University of London, and Essex University, and was the Wesley Clare Mitchell Visiting Professor at Columbia University in spring 2020. So just before COVID hit, uh, or maybe during. Uh, he's a pioneer and leading international scholar in the study of networks. His book, Connections, An Introduction to the Economics of Networks, was published in 2007 by Princeton University. A Chinese translation has also appeared in 2010, effectively preventing piracy. He's a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of the Econometric Society, and a member of the Council of Game Theory Society. He was the founding director of Cambridge INET Institute and the chair of the economics faculty at Cambridge from 2014 to 2018. So with that, Sanjeev, the floor is yours. You have an hour. You can take questions as you like. Um, if you can't see them, I can. I will interrupt you and tell you, Sanjeev, there is a question. People can put no. questions in the chat box. And if there is an important question, I can inform and Sanjeev can take a look at the question. Sure, sure. Uh, let me just see. This is. Uh... Can you see the slides? Yes, please. Perfect. Okay. okay, great. So I should start by uh, thanking Sudipta and the organizers for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to have an opportunity to uh, talk about this work. Uh, we have uh, just brought out, um, uh, we've just brought out uh, a, um, a, a paper uh, with uh, you know with, with this work uh, it's on my website and um, it's a uh, joint work with Singju Choi who is at Seoul National University and uh, Fred uh, Fred Mosson who uh, is a postdoc at Cambridge but he's moving to Lyon Lyon Business School uh, in fact he's at the moment in France he's just looking for a place to stay and to live and he will be moving there after four years of being in Cambridge. Um, so a lot of what uh, I, I think is exciting about this uh, project really is uh, due to Fred because he has a very interesting background in engineering and computer science and social uh, behavioral social science. And so uh, the principal innovation of this project is really uh, about running very, very large, uh, very, very large scale experiments in continuous time um, in, in, um, and, and a lot of that, there are technical challenges associated with doing that. And um, so we really uh, were able to uh, use uh, Fred's formidable skills uh, in, in that space. And, and that's uh, uh, the background really to how this started. So let me say a few words about by way of introduction, I think it's probably not uh, really necessary to introduce networks and to, to this community, but um, so there's been a lot of work on the theory of networks uh, over the last 20, 25 years. And uh, there's also been a lot of empirical work on how, uh, what networks look like. Um, uh, feature of uh, networks, which has been widely commented upon is that you have specialization in connections and you have, or if you think about economic networks, you have dominant intermediaries, probably the most well-known of these is Amazon, um, but there are other uh, lookalikes in other parts of the world. Um, so um, what the theory of network formation does is it gives you a, a sort of high level principles on how these networks are formed and, and how, what is the level of efficiency, what are the tensions between efficiency and uh, individual incentives, uh, and also whether these networks are uh, you know, fair or they're going to be very unequal. Okay. So there's a very large body of work. Um, 
partly because uh, this work, the theory has been uh, powerful, people have uh, an, an appealing, people have taken these models to experiments. Uh, they've experimentally tried to test uh, these uh, theor theoretical models. There's a very wide, broad literature on laboratory experiments that surveyed in this paper by Sing Yu Choi and um, Eduardo Gallo and Shaha Karif, uh, but also there's a paper on field experiments in networks by Emily Brazer. Um, so this experimental work draws attention to the role of computation complexity. So how subjects uh, or individuals in these large networks, how they are, you know, struggling to cope with all the computational aspects of functioning in networks. Uh, and also has drawn attention to the role of social preferences, inequity aversion, um, tends to dampen the uh, you know, formation of unequal networks. However, a feature of these experiments, uh, the bulk of these experiments uh, are with very small numbers of subjects, uh, typically four to 12 subjects. Um, and so when you look through these experiments, and uh, there's quite a number of them, I would say, you know, there's some large literature for the last 15 years. Um, the thing that strikes you is that a lot of the interest that we have in networks is about large networks, um, or, or at least modestly large, you know, few hundred subjects, few hundred participants. Uh, and the theory applies to those settings. Uh, but the experiments are with very small numbers, and in fact, they draw attention to computational constraints and um, under rationality. So it's very unclear um, what would happen when you really scale up these experiments. So it's, it's very unclear whether these findings, uh, whether the computational constraints are going to become overwhelming, uh, whether everything is just going to fall apart, or whether some of the things we see in the small groups will somehow be greatly altered. So uh, that's sort of the background. Um, uh, what we do in this project is that we have, um, we do two, two sort of main things uh, relative to the uh, existing literature. One is that we have um, large scale, but the other thing that we change is that subjects are, in the existing world, by and large subjects are uh, playing uh, uh, discrete, they're playing discrete time games. So they play a game and they repeat it maybe 15, 20 times and it's all in discrete time and uh, it's typically synchronized and simultaneous mobile games. So what we do, the second main change we make is that we allow for asynchronous continuous time activity uh, by subjects. Uh, and it's the combination of these two, the scale and the continuous time that uh, creates a number of technical challenges. Um, and uh, so let me just very briefly at a high level mention there are a number of features of the platform. I really won't have time in one hour to go through different aspects of it. Uh, but um, I've mentioned already the continuous time. So when you have continuous time uh, activity on linking and, and efforts, uh, the challenge is that people in the experiment have to keep track of it. So I might be doing something, uh, but uh, Sudipta and others have to see what I'm doing and they should be able to see it uh, pretty much in instantly. And so uh, I need to be able to process all this information um, in real time and, and also visualize the network. Um, and visualization of the network, it's, it's uh, you will see, I'll show you in a moment, is actually quite a, uh, it's, it's a major research field and you will see that it actually is a complicated, um, the sort of many sort of trade-offs there. Um, I've already talked about continuous time. Uh, the other feature of networks is of course that in large networks, you're going to have very limited information about many aspects of the environment. And so there will be many choices, judgment, uh, judgments to be made about what people know about the network and how does that matter for how they behave. So this platform allows us to have a variety of, uh, uh, if you like, um, 
you know, a wide range of possible information uh, settings, both for how much of the network people see and also what they see about the actions of people and what they see about the payoffs of different people. Uh, finally, the platform allows both for one-sided link formation as well as uh, bilateral or two-sided link formation. And so what I'm going to do today um, uh, is I'm going to present to you one experiment in, with one-sided linking and another experiment with two-sided linking, uh, just to give you a feel of how we model uh, and program and you know, how we um, design the, uh, these experiments. Um, so uh, the paper itself has three experiments, uh, but I will only talk about the first and third. The second one is the most complicated one. It has network formation and it has a uh, linking uh, behavior, but it also has effort level. So there's an activity also going on. So it has two strategic variables. And so I, I won't have time to uh, present that. So uh, the linking game is, uh, uh, probably the simplest uh, uh, experiment you know one can think of. It's uh, a, a model that um, is, involves people forming links with each other and accessing the benefits um, from the network. Uh, and the brokerage and market power, the difference is that people form links, but the payoff you get depends on your intermediary position. If you are, uh, if you are critical to many trades taking place, you're going to make a lot of money. And if, uh, on the other hand, there are many uh, other intermediaries who are also like you, then they will compete away the market power and um, um, you won't make any money. And so the, the two differences between the first and third experiment is that you have one-sided linking in experiment one and two-sided linking in experiment, the third experiment. And uh, the payoff allocation is very different. Uh, in the linking game, there is some advantage to being the center of the hub, uh, but no great advantage. Whereas in the brokerage uh, model, if you are the central hub, you are going to get a cut uh, of all the transactions that are being made. And that could lead to very, very great inequality. So what's the high level takeaway from these experiments? Uh, the first high level takeaway is linking is costly in all these experiments. And so the first high level takeaway is that uh, subjects are very, very careful about forming links. So they create sparse networks. Uh, we will see they are very, very sparse. So they are just connected, a little more than connected. So there's very few redundant links. Um, uh, the efficiency is very high. In most cases, uh, it's 70 or 80% of the best equilibrium. So in other words, subjects are uh, really good at coordinating their activity and arriving uh, you know, at, at good networks. Uh, the third major takeaway uh, is that um, going from small to large scale, uh, yields a number of insights. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, when you go from uh, small to large scale, uh, you see a number of uh, patterns in the network, uh, but also you see very different behavior of subjects. So when you have a small scale, you may be uh, getting you know, the equilibrium prediction uh, but when you go to the large scale, you get the equilibrium prediction, but the behavior that underlies that, uh, uh, that emergence of the equilibrium is going to be very different. Uh, in particular, um, uh, as you scale up, there is a sense in which the size of the pie is growing and, uh, and therefore it becomes people can test uh, the position to be the hub and that contest becomes uh, very intense and leads to very, very large efforts on the part of the hubs. Uh, and, and that's very distinctive uh, when you scale up. Uh, and that leads to very, very particular effects on uh, payoffs. Um, and, and finally, I'll also talk about how scale helps you separate um, 
different uh, treatments in some, when you're on the small scale, uh, when you vary the treatment, the outcomes are not significantly different, but when you scale up, the differences are very large. So it's only when you scale up that you see the full implications of some economic variable. So let me just walk you through uh, very quickly uh, through uh, some features of the uh, form which are interesting. So I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, are going, we are going to do net real-time visualization and it's going to matter because uh, traditionally in Netflix experiments, the location of the nodes is fixed. So here you see that um, I have uh, 20 nodes and their location is fixed and this is the network. Uh, but if I allow myself the freedom to uh, relocate the nodes, this is how the network looks. This is the same network. All I've done is I have uh, reconfigured the location of the, uh, the nodes. And I have, of course, used a particular algorithm to uh, create this, uh, you know, this particular... Um, so, so, so this visualization algorithm is good, especially good at highlighting highly connected central nodes. Um, and there are other features, of course, of this visualization package, which are discussed at length in the paper. But you can see immediately that if I want people to make decisions which are well informed, it would matter whether I showed them the network on the left, which would be more the traditional form, or I would show them the network on the right, which is um, you know, which has been optimized, if you like, to highlight some features of the network. Um, so let me skip this. Uh, so I mentioned this earlier, I could show you, uh, there is this person at the bottom in yellow, that, that's me, or that's the subject who's looking at the screen, and, and we can show them the entire network, uh, or we can just show them uh, the local network, okay, as in this slide. So, um, and then all the people who are not shown uh, who are not on the local network. Uh, so these are people outside the two neighborhood. Uh, they are put, they are uh, all put parked on the right hand side. And we don't really know what the network uh, between them looks like. Okay. So similarly, I can show the payoffs of, uh, 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 you know, payoffs of others uh, by coloring the nodes, or I can, of course, provide uh, uh, you know, the payoffs in another form. Uh, here I've shown the payoffs of everyone in terms of the numbers. So if I look at the player ID, P up, let's say there's me here and I'm earning 113. Okay. So this is actually the actual payoff. Um, so that's another variation one can have in this platform. Uh, I'll come back to this linking protocol. So let me move on to the experiment. Um, so let me walk you through. Uh, this is a very, very simple uh, model. This is taken from a paper I uh, wrote uh, with Venki Bala. And the model is um, there are n players and they uh, form links with each other. Uh, link costs k. And uh, link gives you access to the value, to the benefits of uh, the person you're linking with but also to the people that this person she has linked with. And, and the, there's, some, there's some decay or discounting that's captured by the parameter delta. And so the further away someone is for me on the shortest path, uh, the lower uh, the, the indirect benefits I get. Okay, so, so the payoff, given some choices of links, you get a network G and it's a directed graph uh, but then um, I have defined this G bar. G bar is, if you like, the uh, closure of the graph G or the undirected version of the graph G, which is simply uh, for every link G i j, uh, G bar i j, simply the max of G i j and G j i. Okay, so it's a sort of converting a, a directed graph into an undirected graph for the purposes of computing the benefits. Uh, and then eta i is the cost for link. And so the payoff is V, this is the benefit I have for my own information, plus V times for each person J, delta Dij, that's the discount I apply to the benefit V for person J. 
So, uh, so I want to form as few links as possible and I want to be as close to as many people as possible. Okay, that's the goal of this. Um, so what are the predictions of this model? Uh, the predictions, yes, come in. Yes, hello. Are there any questions? No, 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 go ahead. Sir. So what are the predictions? Well, the typical, so uh, prediction is that there's a variety of networks that can arise in equilibria. Uh, the empty network arises whenever you can see when the cost K is greater than V, then of course, the, if everybody is isolated, then that remains as an Ash equilibrium. Um, on the other hand, if K is smaller than V, then of course I must connect to everyone because K is the cost and V is the benefit. So, uh, so that's a simple intuition that when K is small, you should get connected graphs. When K is large, you should get, you could get sparse or empty graphs. Okay. Uh, but there is a range of values for K and V where you can get both empty and, and star networks as equilibria. Um, so there is a lot of multiplicity of equilibria in this, uh, in this model. And moreover, the, uh, the star networks can have different people as hubs. So there is a further level of multiplicity. So it's, it's very unclear what will happen in this uh, model okay, in, in, in a general sense. Um, it's worth noting that the star network is efficient uh, for a very large class of parameters, uh, or especially the ones we will use in our treatments. Um, but the hub is going to earn roughly one and a half times what the spokes earn. So there is significant inequality. It's not huge inequality, but it's, it's pretty significant. So here's a simple example of a star network where the spokes have formed the links. Um, and uh, we want to test what happens, okay? Whether you get, the literature has uh, argued that uh, you don't get to the star network because it has significant inequality. So it's inequity aversion, which comes in the way. Because if you're going to be thinking about this as we go along in this experiment. Um, so, so our view is that um, subjects will create a sparse network uh, and they will create a hub spoke like network because it's an equilibrium and it's efficient even though, you know, as I said, it has inequality. Okay. Uh, as I said, uh, there is a lot of experimental background, you know, in this, in this field and uh, typically subjects don't converge to these unequal sparse networks. Uh, and the reason is people think it's due to inequity aversion. So we're gonna look at, uh, we're gonna have parameters, the V is gonna be set equal to 10, the decay delta will be set equal to 0 0.9. Um, group size will be 10, 50 and 100, and the cost of linking will be raised correspondingly to keep the payoff somewhat comparable. Um, okay, so the payoffs will, uh, the cost of linking will go up from 20 to 100 to 200. Okay, so notice that when I go from 10 to 50, I'm raising, at five times, and so I'm raising the cost also by five times. Okay, so we ran this experiment. Uh, so we're going to have four groups of 10, four groups of 50, and four groups of 100. Uh, so uh, that gives us 640 subjects. They were, the experiments were run in Linux, which is a, a very good lab in Valencia, Spain. Um, the way we ran this experiment, there were, this is going to be also the the structure for the next experiment in brokerage. Uh, each group, uh, there are four groups, for each treatment, each group plays six rounds of linking uh, and each round is six minutes. So uh, they play 36 minutes. Um, and there are, uh, the, there are six rounds. The first round is a trial round. It doesn't count for payoffs. And in each of the subsequent five rounds, the first minute is a trial minute. So the, only the last five minutes of the last five rounds count for payoffs. So here's a, a, a typical a high level uh, takeaway from this experiment. Okay, so what's the same? This is an N equal to 100 um, experiment. And what I've done is I've shown you a snapshot at minute three 
uh, is, is, is representative of what we see in these experiments. So what we see is on the left at minute three, you have this hub who's depicted in red and she's uh, formed many links which are depicted in red. Uh, she's already, you know, pretty central in this network. But, but by minute six, what you see is that she is still the hub, but she has deleted all her links, which were costly, and, and they've been replaced by links formed by the spokes. Okay, so that's the high level dynamic, and this is uh, what we see in the large groups. Okay. Is, is this clear to, to everyone? Yeah, can I ask one, one now? Sure, sure. Yeah, so, uh, so my doubt is that to uh, uh, before beginning of the experiments all participants are somewhat symmetric right yes so so then how this hub or the center will be like uh, come out from the experiment so who is this the unique player who comes out as a center of the star yeah so um, what so I could answer this in sort of many ways. Uh, let me just say that um, one explanation could be that some people are... Um, so what we see in the data is that there are some people who form many links. Okay. So when you form any links, you of course become attractive as a hub. Because if you form any links, then uh, what it means is that if you form any links, then I can link with you and then access many people through you. Uh, who will be very close to you. Mm -hmm. That makes you attractive. So what one way of thinking about your question is to ask, do we see at the initial rounds of initial few minutes, initial you know, period of play, very different behavior from different subjects? So is it the case that lots of people are trying to become hubs? Or is it the case that most people are very happy to sit back and watch who becomes a hub and then quietly link with one of them? And it's a latter which we, which is more, which is closer to the experiment that there are a few people. So for instance, in a group of 100, maybe four or five subjects who uh, are very active initially in the first minute or so. Uh, most of the people form very few links. That's the only activity you can do in this experiment. And, um, uh, but then by minute three, as you see, um, you know, one person has become the mm. hub and now it's very hard to displace this person. Okay. okay, so, so but, but you can see, begin to see that the hub position is being contested, but you don't see many competitors here. I haven't put up maybe the best picture, but if you look at minute one, two, you will see not just a single person who's got many links, but there will be uh, three or four people proposing many links, okay? Uh, but by the time you get to minute three, most of them sort of uh, get washed out, okay? And one person emerges as the hub. Okay, so what's, what are the kind, remember the high level findings were on the sparsity of the graph, the architecture of the graph, the efficiency of the network and the inequality. Okay. Sanjeev, so let's go through. A question. Uh, what happens if, so links can be broken unilaterally, what happens if you need permission to break links? So this is going to come up, uh, no. Okay, so there is no, uh, in the experiments we have in this paper, in all the experiments, I can unilaterally delete a link. So we don't know uh, what I will do in the second experiment is that I will need your permission to form a link with you. It's a bit like Facebook. Uh, but in that experiment, I mean, essentially in all the experiments we've run, I think it's in line with the networks literature. You can unilaterally delete links. Yeah, I think, I think that you will see this bilateral versus unilateral actually is a first order factor. And you will see when we do that experiment, it will make a big difference. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing to see is sparsity. Okay, so we see um, if you have 100 players uh, to keep the network connected, you need 99 links at a minimum. And so what you see here is um, the average in degree on the left is very close to one for the small graph. Uh, and, and whereas it's a little above one 
the in degree, which is really the same thing as the average out degree for n equal to 100. So you're getting very sparse graphs. On the right hand side, you get an impression of the uh, linking inequality. And you see that it's quite high. The Gini coefficient is almost 0.70%. Okay. Um, so that it's pretty unequal, the distribution of links. Um, the second issue is how close no the nodes are to each other. And you see that the, uh, remember that in a star network, the average distance is going to be of the order of two. Okay, so, and indeed what you see is in N is 10, you get something which is pretty close to two. Okay, so it is really a very, very um, tightly organized network, very sparse and tightly organized. But when you go to N equal to 100, uh, the average distance is still actually under three, uh, which is really quite uh, striking. And so to uh, tease this out a bit further, we look at closeness centrality. And, and again, there uh, you see that the closeness centrality is, um, uh, is very high. So it's almost 0.8. Uh, just to give you an idea, even the uh, scale-free networks of Barabasi Albert would give you uh, closeness centrality of just 0 0.52. So this is very, very high uh, closeness centrality. It's very close to a half spoke structure. Um, this is just saying that this network has converged the stability. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is the picture on the left, which is telling you uh, the probability of remaining the hub. If you're a hub today, what's the probability you remain the hub next period? That really grows when you scale up. So the red line is uh, basically uh, dominating the green and the blue lines. That suggests that once you become a hub in a large group, it's very difficult to displace you. Okay. So let me uh, move to efficiency. Uh, and the efficiency, recall the, the hub spoke network is efficient in our range of parameters. Uh, and what we get here is, you know, uh, around 90% efficiency for n equal to 10, which is much higher than what was reported in uh, earlier experiments. But even for n equal to 100, the red line, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of 75% the efficiency, which is, uh, in our view, very high, given the difficulties involved in coordinating and the large number of subjects. Um, so the final thing I want to talk about is how scale affects behavior and payoffs. So um, what we see here, um, uh, maybe I should skip, skip this. Uh, let me just see. Okay, so what's going on is, um, so what we do in this experiment, that's going to also be the pattern in the second experiment, is that we look at um, um, the out degree, uh, which recall will be the number of links I form. Okay. So what happens here is that the hub, remember in the equilibrium, the hub forms zero links. Everybody forms links with the hub. So what you see here is that the most connected person okay, um, has actually very few links. So 0 0.1 is 10% of the links. So, you know, one out of 10 or 10 out of 100. Um, but on the right hand side, you see that the most connected person earns the highest payoff all the way through. Uh, she forms very few links and she, she earns the highest payoff. This is going to be very different uh, when you look at n equal to 50 or n equal to 100. So now you see that uh, in the n equal to 50, the most connected person actually forms many, many links. She's formed links with 30 people at the start because her out degree is 0 0.3, which is 30 links. And, and because she's formed so many links, she's getting destroyed on the payoff. So you look on the right-hand side of the picture, you see that she's earning uh, you know, very, very large negative payoffs. So of course, you'll recall in the dynamic picture, the snapshots I showed you uh, in minute three, she was really um, you know, forming far too many links. 
and that's reflected here in the low negative payoffs. But then over time, of course, she becomes, she deletes these links. As you can see, she, the number of links goes to pretty close to zero. And correspondingly, her payoffs go up, but it comes pretty late. Uh, so so in, in fact, overall, she, she doesn't, she earns less than the spokes. Okay, so, so that's a big difference you see in the, uh, that's due to the scale. Uh, that's a scale effect. So overall, on average, the scale, the, the hub actually makes less money than the spoke. Uh, in the large scale, in the small scale, the hub always makes more money. Okay. So the inequality, the concern with inequality in the small scale is now uh, turned on its head because uh, the, uh, the investments needed to contest the unit you know, to become the hub are so great that you don't actually make a lot of money uh, by being the hub. Okay, so, so that's sort of, the other thing to note, of course, is that in contrast to earlier experiments, the hub does form and, and it actually does earn more than the spokes in the small scale, which corresponds to the earlier experiments. And this, in our view, is due to the continuous time aspect of what we are doing. Okay. So let me just summarize. Um, I've shown you the question. Three. Yep. So, um, so the thing is, you're saying that you know the inequality um, in the small scale is higher, and then in the large scale, because of the effort required. But if we were to continue repeating once the hub has been formed, and you know add more periods, obviously the inequality should also increase for in the large scale networks. So, so beyond the six minutes, if I were to keep going and add more periods. So yeah, like so, once you become Amazon, maybe you can keep on so, making lots so of I should, I should have probably said this earlier. Um, the way the payoffs are computed and the way people are paid is actually not based on what happens at the end, but what's happening at a random point in the last five minutes. So strictly speaking, uh, people should not be waiting till the end because any moment, you know, a game might end. I mean, any moment somehow, you know, they often may realize. So I see what you're saying, but notice that if I extended the game, the, uh, the incumbent and the challenger, you know, who want to come in and fight, might also fight for longer. So let me go back a little bit to show you what's happening here. So let's look at n equal to 100 here. And so you have the most connected player, but you also have the challenger, the second most connected player. And this person is fighting it out. You can see that she's forming many links to, to, to keep up, you see, with the hub. And she's also doing that in the, um, uh, you know, in n equal to 50. But uh, that may, you know, she may go off. Uh, she may keep going, you know, she might fight longer and etc. So it's not very clear uh, that if supposing we ran the experiment for 12 minutes, that it would just be, you know, uh, a continuation of this, where on the, on the, you know, you would basically have the hub behaving, forming zero links after minute four or something, and, uh, and earning, you know, a lot more than the spokes. It's, it's not very clear because people are forward looking here. These guys clearly are forward looking. So, and yeah. Another small related question was, so the desire to form, um, you know, networks with small diameter is driven by partly the delta. So uh, how sensitive is the result to having one central hub if I start to vary delta? Because if delta is one, maybe there doesn't have to be one star, right? So if there is no decay at all. Yeah, so, yeah, so of course as the decay, yeah, so sure, so as the decay, factor gets closer to one, you care less and less about distance. Uh, so you, but, but notice that you will still not want to have cycles because that's really wasted money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you might have more, um, we haven't done an experiment on that, but it's, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, so yeah, I mean, I think it's anyone's guess, you know, whether the diameter will expand with Delta, uh, sorry, it, or shrink with Delta. 
Yeah, so I, I, I yeah, can I trade off between the delta and the cost of link formation, and you know, so it's not clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah it's not. Uh, I mean, what we know is that this is a unique, efficient uh, architecture, and that is, I think, pretty robust. That result. So to the extent that subjects care about efficiency, which uh, it's certainly coming through in these experiments, I think they will push towards the house network. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one, just one small yes, one? Sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, given the results, uh, is it correct to say that uh, small and large scale experiments over time converge to the similar values over time? Is it correct to say given the and yeah, so what we're seeing in these experiments is that you're getting to the same kind of network, but the behavior that accompanies that, that the dynamics that uh, lead to the yeah. network are quite different. Because if I go back here, you'll see that in the yes. small groups, the hub is not forming many links. True, 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 true. Whereas here, the hub is forming huge numbers of links. So, so in a different way that small versus large maybe the convergent point could be the same but the trajectory by which or the behavior through which they are converging is 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 the main difference in a sense here yeah. so in these experiments yes uh, and but what it means of course is that the uh, inequality is very different because in in the small scale you actually get inequality. The hub does earn, you know, uh, uh, yeah, sort of one and a half times, you know. So it's, uh, the hub is a traditional hub. It's just a lazy fellow who becomes the hub purely by chance or somehow by luck and then just stays on and makes more money. Uh, whereas in the large group, the hub has to fight it out and uh, invests uh, a lot of resources to become the hub and then there isn't enough time, in fact, to recoup the loss and re re recoup the investments. Um, okay. So, uh, I mean, I should say that we collected data on their comprehension and their risk level, et cetera, et cetera, of all these subjects. And there is no correlation between those, uh, you know, traits, if you like, risk aversion and level of comprehension and the behavior in the experiment. So, so somehow you can't attribute it just to not understanding the game or being very risk taking. Okay. Um, okay, so this is uh, um, uh, one experiment and uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, you have about 18 minutes. Okay, so let me um, speed up a little bit. So this is, a, uh, this is an experiment on intermediation and it's a very, very basic type of experiment. Uh, let me walk you, to, so of course the motivation is um, uh, we, we've seen you know, the emergence of global intermediaries. Uh, uh, you can pick your favorite one here. There is a retail uh, uh, inform intermediaries like Google and there are banking uh, uh, intermediaries like HSBC. Uh, so a key thing that these guys are doing are the basic, they're acting as intermediaries between people who want to connect and they're taking a cut. So what, what we want to do here is we want to have a model of network uh, networks where people can trade only if they have a path between them. Um, and so uh, I have here on the left, P1 and P3 can trade because they have a direct link. At the right, they can trade, but then they have to go through some intermediaries and they can choose one of two paths, the, the top path, if you like, and the bottom path. And, um, and so they, they need to figure out what to do, anticipating that, you know, uh, there is, uh, if on the left, if I'm a direct, if I'm trading directly, then we don't have to pay any intermediaries and brokerage fees. On the right, I may have to pay some brokerage fees depending on which path I use and depending on how competitive the environment is. 
so what I'd need to do is to trade off the cost of linking. If I link with everyone, well, then I don't pay any intermediation cost, but then I pay for the linking. By contrast, if I form very few links, uh, then I must be accessing other traders through some intermediaries, and so I have to pay some intermediation charges. So that's the trade-off. And what we're interested in is we're going to look at two models of uh, brokerage fees or intermediation fees. So there is a, a model that um, is like a Bertrand competition model. Uh, we wrote that uh, paper with Fernando Vega, I don't know. And, um, so the idea here is you have trade between the two red circle nodes, P7 and P2, and um, they have to, they're not directly connected, so they have to use paths and they have to use intermediaries. And there are really um, three paths you can see. So there's a path on the left. I can use me, P, P9, P8, P1. I can use the second path, me, P4, P1, or I can use the path on the right, P, P3, and P1. Okay. And uh, so you can use any of these parts and uh, uh, how much do you have to pay to use these parts and what do the intermediaries earn? So what we did was we had a very simple rule, which is that you will earn something if you lie on all parts. So in this simple example, P1 and me lie on all parts, whereas the others, P9, P8, P4, and P3 lie on, are, can be avoided somehow. They don't lie on all parts. So our idea was that you are going to get some cut brokerage fee if you are critical, if you lie on all parts. And then the you just split the, so if the value is V, you split it equally between the terminal agents, P7 and P2, and the number of critical traders, which is two in this case. So everybody gets one fourth of the service. Okay. Um, then, the number of people actually who have written models with betweenness based, uh, smoother, uh, probably in some ways a more uh, intuitive uh, intermediation protocol. Uh, it's a very nice paper by. Sorry, is there a question? No, no. go ahead. Sir. So, this is a paper by John Kleinberg and Eva Tardosh and Siddharth Suri and Tom Wexler, um, so it's the same network, but now um, you can see that um, um, what they propose is that you look at the shortest paths and only the shortest paths are relevant and you have to pay people on the shortest paths. All the shortest paths will have some chance of so the extent to which an intermediary will earn money is going to be proportional to the number of shortest paths on which she lies, which is really uh, the definition of betweenness centrality. So you see here that uh, I have to go through these two shortest paths and, and so I have to you know, uh, use up. So there are three intermediaries, so I have to pay them, you know, uh, split it with them. So I will be getting V by five. And the two guys, P4 and P3, uh, I will use one of the two parts. So they lie on half of the, so each of them has, if you like, half of betweenness, centrality vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, P7 and P2. So they get V by 10 uh, each, okay? Whereas P1 and me get V by five because we lie on all the shortest parts between P7 and P2. So that's how you define betweenness based pricing. So I won't have time to go through the theory. It's developed at, at length in the paper, but um, the criticality-based uh, pricing, you can see that a cycle is going to be, it's going to be stable. Uh, so now we are doing two-sided linking. So we're going to use the jackson wolinsky pairwise stability uh, idea to define um, what's a sort of strategically stable network. So why is a cycle stable where a cycle is stable? Because uh, first of all, nobody has an incentive to form more links because nobody is critical in the cycle. And if you form more links, you're not gonna become critical. So there's no intermediation attraction to forming links. And there is no access advantage to forming a link. Whereas deleting a link will make you have to pay very large intermediation charges. So, so now this, uh, this logic doesn't hold under betweenness 
Why? Because if you're on a large cycle, then you're having to pay, you know, you will be paying along the shortest path. And that could be very long, that shortest path in a large cycle. And so if you, you could form a link across the cycle and you could circumvent all these intermediaries. And not only that, because you have the shortest path, you could become, uh, 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 you could lie on many shortest paths for many guys who are near you and near the guy on the other side of the circle. So for this sort of, because of this reasoning, betweenness-based pricing is going to rule out the cycle as a stable network. So this is a treatment variable. We've changed the pricing rule and uh, it has an impact on what is a pairwise stable network. It should be said, however, that the star network is, is pairwise stable under both protocols. And um, so we wanted to test what happens in the, uh, you know, as we uh, vary these prices and we vary the group size. Okay, so we're going to have groups of size 10, 50, and 100. And uh, we're going to have these two pricing treatments. So remember that under criticality, you have the cycle, which is almost efficient because it has n links and you need n minus one links. Okay, but it's perfectly egalitarian because everyone is symmetrically located. By contrast, in the star network, uh, clearly the hub is going to earn a lot of money compared to the spokes. In the between is based, um, you don't have this option of having a cycle, so you have the star, and you, on the other hand, have the complete network. It could be stable, okay? Something that would never happen under criticality based. So uh, this is the setting, and uh, uh, let me show you. Uh, so these are the parameters, V equals 10, uh, and these are the linking costs. Uh, the hub spoke network is efficient and very unequal. The cycle is almost efficient and equal. Uh, notice that if I look at the ratio of the max to the median payoff, uh, that ratio is four and n equal to 10, it's 18 for n equal to 50, and it's 35 for n equal to 100. So that gives you a sense of the inequality, the, the range of inequality in these, uh, uh, in, the, in the star network. So it's very, very uh, unequal. Okay, so um, the hypothesis we're going to look at, uh, subjects are going to create sparse networks because linking is costly. Um, under criticality pricing, our hypothesis is that subjects are going to create equal and large average distance networks uh, like the cycle or interconnected cycles. Whereas under betweenness pricing, that's not an option. You don't create large cycles because they're incentives to a certain vendor through additional links. So our conjecture is that they will create unequal and small average distance networks. So this is a setting where efficiency and equilibrium coincide, but inequality is great. Okay, so uh, this is snapshots from the criticality. You see a very sort of, there is no uh, efficiency 61%, inequality is 3.1. Um, as I go along at minute three, efficiency is close to 80%, it's very efficient, so it's connected. There are very few redundant links, inequality is still modest. And at the end, it's about 80% efficiency and inequality is 2.5. There are a few nodes with many links, but they don't have a great deal of um, uh, criticality power. By contrast, if I look at the between this case, you see that efficiency is very low at the start. And that is because there are a lot of links being created. Inequality is at different levels entirely. It's almost 15. So remember that the inequality here is 2.5, 3, and 3. Okay, so we've got a massive uh, spike in inequality. Uh, as I go along in a 3, the inequality ratchets up to 34.6. Efficiency grows, but you see the emergence of local hubs, which is further reinforced and at the end, the efficiency is good, it's about 70%, but the inequality is very high. So this is the ratio of the hubs payoff versus the median payoff. Okay, okay so um, the rest of the talk, I mean, I have, I guess about, is it about seven, eight minutes, uh, Sudip? Yeah, I think you can take about, uh, let's see. Yeah, you can take about seven, eight minutes easily. Yeah. Okay. So, you can keep it in that. 
So what are the high level, so what are the more systematic findings? Well, we see that the network is very sparse under criticality. Uh, remember that uh, the degree, average degree, um, um, Okay, so let me be a little careful here because um, so remember that the degree in the star network is roughly two, and uh, so you see that uh, on, for criticality as you scale up, it doesn't make a big difference. The, the degree goes up, but it's still very modest, so it's still a very sparse graph. Uh, on the right, you see for betweenness, the degree really shoots up. And this is, of course, the main reason for the fall in deficiency. Uh, linking inequality is dramatically different. Uh, under criticality, the Gini coefficient is around 0.2 to 0.3, whereas under betweenness, it goes up to 0.5. And we saw that in the snapshots, you have the hubs emerging and they are really uh, creating huge inequality. Um, with regard to closeness, you see that the average distance um, uh, is around four or five in the large networks in under criticality, but it's actually below three uh, in the uh, between. So you see there's a big difference in the uh, how close people are in the network. Um, so we have a situation where we are getting a sparse network under criticality, which is rather diffused, decentralized, and we are getting a denser network, but which is very unequal and uh, very short average distances. Um, so this is closeness centrality, which is just, it's a mirror image of what we saw earlier. Um, and the stability of the broker there is no broker, there is no top broker in the criticality treatment. In the betweenness treatment, you see that as you take, as you go into large groups, uh, there's, uh, there's great persistence of the hub after roughly 100 seconds. Um, okay, so let me uh, summarize the findings. Uh, so far, network structure. We get sparse, equal, and spread out networks under criticality, and we get sparse, unequal, and small average distance networks under between. So you get very different networks. Uh, that difference is not uh, very visible if you look at small size. So if you look at the small size here, uh, there's some difference, uh, but the green pictures on the left and the right look quite similar. It's when you scale up that you really see the big difference emerging. Uh, okay, and the same is true here. So when you scale up, then you really see the difference, the diffuse network on the left and the concentrated small world network on the right, likewise out here. So uh, it's this uh, interaction between scale and pricing protocol. Um, let's look at efficiency. Again, there are huge scale effects uh, that are pretty modest. When you look at small scale, they are quite similar. The green pictures are quite similar. Uh, but when you look at the red, the n equal to 100, there's a huge difference. Um, uh, the last uh, uh, set of findings is about inequality. So if you see that if I look at criticality, um, and I look at the payoffs, um, there are some differences. Uh, the, the, the most connected guy is earning more, uh, but they are still not that great, the differences, okay? But now when I look at the big group of n equal to 50, you see a completely different picture. So you see that in the under criticality, uh, basically the, um, uh, the payoffs are very similar of the most popular and the others. Whereas in the uh, betweenness treatment, the payoff of the um, most popular is huge is just enormous compared to the others. And, and so that's uh, the big scale effect I was talking about and that turns up in, when you scale up and it's not really very visible uh, in the small scale. 
Uh, and this is all happening due to brokerage rents, uh, because if you look at these picture here, you see um, N equal to 50 in the criticality treatment, the brokerage rents are essentially negligible in the top part of the figure. In the bottom part, you see that uh, uh, under bro between this, the brokerage rents are very large. And that's also true for N equal to 100. Okay, so, so I'm basically, uh, done. Uh, this is a, the high level summary uh, of these experiments. So we've created a platform uh, to run continuous time large scale experiments of up to 100 subjects. They've all been done in the lab and sometimes you had to connect two labs. So there was uh, the advantage of doing this thing in the lab of course is that you can control everything and there are very few, there's very little noise and there have been some major problems pointed out with uh, mechanical Turk online experiments. So those problems we can avoid. Um, experiments seem to support very strongly uh, the intuitions that we get from the theory. Um, in all cases, networks are very sparse. Uh, in all cases, uh, subjects create, except for one case, subjects create very efficient networks, around 70 to 80% of the most efficient equilibrium. Um, but the network structure that's created depends, and it's only when you look at the large scale that you can see that you can get both sparse and unequal and sparse and equal and dispersed networks. Um, and that turns out to be in line with the theory, and it turns out to be in line with uh, matching efficiency and inequality and inequality, avoiding inequality. and. If you can get an equilibrium network that's efficient and that's equal, you will always go for that. And that's what we see in, the, in, in, in this experiment. Um, we also see that the, uh, the relationship between hubs, uh, high degrees and inequality, high degrees and payoffs is reversed when you go from small scale to large scale. Uh, um, and that relates to the dynamics of how these networks are formed. And so um, that's sort of worth noting as well. It's, it's really uh, something that you only get to see when you have large scale. Um, so we, uh, we were hoping to run experiments on learning, social learning in networks, and essentially we were going to run them in May. And we then were forced to run them online and we are still trying to learn how to run them online. So, uh, uh, but we are hoping uh, also now to run experiments with network formation and social learning uh, very soon. So uh, that's the next set of uh, experiments we are hoping to do. So I'm done. Yeah, so this, I think we have time for questions. Yeah, we have time for questions. Absolutely. If Feel free. Uh, can I ask something? Sudip Yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. Dina. Yeah, Sanjeev, uh, I just have this query about the cost calculation. You said that the cost is calculated at some random time between the first and the sixth minute. Is that, uh, did I understand correctly? No, the payoffs are calculated. Uh, yeah, so, so basically at any instant in time, you have a network and that gives you the payoffs. So there are 360 seconds. The last 300 seconds are relevant for payoffs and we pick one at random. And how, how is the cost calculated? Is that clear? Yeah, that is clear. Uh, and the cost, is it a per minute cost? So the cost is calculated based on the links you have created. Uh, the links I have created throughout the experiment or only the links that- Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so yeah, so, so at any moment, so what we, the way we do this, uh, the computations is that at any moment, um, uh, we, we take a snapshot of the network and that determines the cost that you're paying at that instant. Okay. So, so I think maybe you're asking questions about the continuous time aspect. So we are not doing it literally in continuous time. So we've actually taken 360 snapshots or 300 snapshots of the last five minutes and we're only looking at payoffs at that instant when we take the shot. It's not a flow cost. It's not a flow cost. Okay. Not a flow cost. So, so that's what I was worried about because I, I somehow feel that in the 
trade intermediation kind of experiment the flow would also matter because you need to maintain a platform so to say to be a successful intermediate yes yeah, so but there are no flow costs so but but okay so all right so let me sort of so the way this works is as long as i keep the link on i know that i am paying the cost but but of course it only matters if that instant is picked in the yeah so it, it's not a perfect yeah I see that there is a there's some issue here, but I hope I, it's clear what we have done. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is clear. It is absolutely clear. I was just wondering because it has implications on the results, possibly. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think in uh, in all honesty, I should say that the the theory is for a static one shot game, whereas the experiment is a continuous time dynamic game. With lots of other stuff going on, so there is no reason, a priori, to believe that uh, you know you would expect a lot more action in the dynamic game. And indeed, that's what we see. We see all this uh, jockeying to become the hub, and this is not at all part of the static model. Yeah. So it's so. so yeah, so I mean, what's interesting is at the end, you do get something which is very close to the equilibrium prediction of a very simple one shot game. Okay. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. So, so I, I, I think we are all absolutely floored with the design and the running of the experiment. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, we. We had, I mean, uh, especially I think in the second experiment where we contrast the two pricing treatments, um, I mean, it, it's, I think subjects are extremely clever. Uh, you know, you have to realize that when you're doing this two-sided linking, uh, I should probably spend a few minutes on that because I think that's a nice feature of what we are doing here. Let me uh, spend a couple of minutes on explaining the protocols. Uh, so what happens when you do linking in the one-sided model is extremely simple. I just form a link with you. I just double click on you and the link is created. So that's what happens in the slide um, on the left-hand side. There's no link and then I press double click on your node and then there's a link is created. Likewise, if you double click on me, there's a, you know, incoming link. And the judgments one could make, many different ways one could run this. One way of doing it would be to pick two people and ask them to have some communication and decide whether they want to form a link uh, to really make it bilateral. Uh, what we have opted to do, uh, because we had so many players and we were running out of time, is that we, um, the way we have uh, done it is, uh, you look on the right hand side, there's me who is proposing a link to P1. When I propose a link to P1, to being a square, okay? But when P1 looks at me, P1 sees me as having proposed a link to P1. So P1 is going to see me as a triangle. In this picture, of course, P1 has proposed a link to me and therefore P1 is a triangle, okay? So what you're gonna see as the game evolves is on the screen, you're gonna see people with whom you have links so there are both proposal link to, but they haven't reciprocated. So there are squares. And then there are folks who have proposed links to you and you haven't responded. And they will be triangles. So it's going to be a very, as a central guy, you can't in a coordinated way, you know, form links with many people because you have to propose links to them and they have to respond. And notice that I may have proposed links to many people, I'm the hub vis-a-vis -vis, let's say 10, 20 people, but they don't really know that I have proposed links to all these other folks because they don't see that. Only I see whether people have proposed links to me. Okay, so the information is very local uh, and, and therefore, you know, the formation uh, of the hub is very, you know, in the two-sided model, challenging. And this is one reason I think why you don't see, uh, you know, really a hub, if you like, you know, uh, a true hub. I mean, this person is 
very central and but you know it doesn't have like 90 links okay and this is because of the coordination problems uh, arising out of all the information issues we have in the two-sided linking case yeah thank you thank you sanjeev sanjeev i yeah. guess we we'll continue only for a couple of minutes i was going no, to suggest sure. I'm, I'm available yeah Okay, if you remove, if you stop sharing the screen, uh, the no, slides, no, no, no. maybe we can yeah. do a screenshot of everybody with their camera switched on. Sure. So I have stopped sharing. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. It still says you're share, you're viewing Sanjeev's screen. It still says, and then maybe yeah. Anirban will take a screenshot of everybody. Okay, let me. How do I do this? Uh, uh, it should be on view options. To, uh, uh, view options. Stop sharing. Shared. Oh, it's yes, Paul. Yes, stop okay. sharing. Yeah. Okay, I go down. New share. Resume share. Stop sharing. Okay, maybe I can do it. Maybe you can do it. I don't know. How do I stop? In the top right corner, there seems to be a share. Word written top oh, right stop share part okay. on the red bar. That's good, right? Okay, stop share. Yeah, so I was going to suggest if people will switch on their cameras, then uh, Anirban will take a picture for the web page. Anirban, let us know when you're done. Uh, I'm I'm still waiting for some, but okay. Let me let me just uh, take it now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Done. Thank you. Um, we can. Go